Again, it's good to be back with everybody this evening, and we're glad to have heard a good the word study that brings out a great much a great amount of the vividness with which God presents His care to us and our need to reside in His care. And Ken does a great job on that. I would like to begin where we left off last week in the book of Jude, looking at verse three, and that's what we were on when we closed out the class. So I'll start back again over it. Beloved, verse three, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith, which was, the King James says, once delivered unto the saints. American Standard 1901, once for all delivered the saints. I like the translation of the American Standard because that gives more impetus to the fact that there's not Latter-day Revelation. Now, we can learn that from other things we studied last week, and we referred you to Galatians 1, uh, that there's only one gospel system. We commented on the fact that every Christian should be ready to deal with salvation that's common to us all, the fundamentals and first principles of the gospel and the right division of the word, 2 Timothy 2.15. But then there needs to be also the ability to when something appears that we might not have expected, that we can shift gears, as it were, to deal with that because it now needs to be dealt with before anything else. And Jude makes that very clear. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you. It wasn't they didn't know already that it's part of the Christian responsibility to stand up for the truth and expose error. But like many things, we have to be encouraged or exhorted or urged to act on what we know. And that's a part of our own study and our help to one another. In fact, it's a part of Christian fellowship that we encourage one another, that we exhort one another, and of course, even when necessary, rebuke one another for our sins and urge repentance. But in this case, to exhort them, not that they need to be taught that such is a part of faithful Christian living, but they needed to put it into practice when called upon, we exhort you that you should earnestly, not just contend, but earnestly contend. Your whole heart is in it. There is on your part the great realization to act. It must be done. There's no time to waste. There's a lot of things that we do wherein we waste a lot of time. And sometimes we might not think about it, but we do. And when it comes to something that is as urgent as Jude indicates this was, then he is urging them to earnestly contend. As I closed out last week, I was emphasizing that there are those people who claim to be servants of God, but when things get very tough, such as persecution, trouble in the church through false teaching, ungodly living, such as you run into in the first Corinthian epistle and so on, they want to bow out or they don't want any, they just can't stand any trouble. I just don't want to be in any kind of whatever. Well, they must remember, surely they do, that Jesus gave up perfection in a state of being where he could not even be tempted in the form of God willingly out of his love for us, took upon himself the form of a servant, became a human being, put himself in a position to be tempted to sin by Satan because he was a man. And in the realm of man as a man, he did what we couldn't do. He overcame Satan as a man. And if our Lord could do all of that, then surely we as members of his spiritual body will see the need that when the fires of persecution or attacks made upon the 
faith of Christ, in the New Testament system, the godliness that is set forth in the Bible in general and the New Testament specifically, that we have an obligation to fight the fight of faith, as Paul said he had done. And because of that, there was a crown of righteousness laid up for him. And then he said to Timothy, but not to him only, but to all those that love his, that is Christ's appearing. So there's a need, a, a sharp need, that we not allow anything to hinder us from doing our best to defend the whole of the New Testament system or any component part of it, of the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. So he saw fit to write this letter. And of course, he's inspired of the Holy Spirit, even as the other writers are. And he writes that which they needed, and thus as a part of the New Testament, you need and I need as to our various abilities and using them in defense of the faith. So we're to contend for the faith, which was once delivered in the same. I closed out last week on this by mentioning that this was all delivered to members of the church. Remember, saints here is not as the Roman Catholics determine who is a saint, as they would say, sainthood, but a member of the church is faithful to a saint because he's sanctified. He's set apart to do a specific work. That setting apart to serve God faithfully came when one is converted to Christ. And one is converted to Christ in obedience to the plan of salvation, in believing in Christ, repenting of our sins, confessing our belief or faith in Christ as the Son of God, and completing our obedience by being immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's a saved relationship and to obtain the remission of sin. All of that has to do with being made a saint, being converted, becoming a child of God, being made a Christian, a member of the body of Christ, born of water and the Spirit, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. So that's our obligation. Now, some may do this a lot better than others, but we all ought to strive to stand up, as we sing in the song, stand up for Jesus. Sometimes all we might be able to do is say, well, you can go the way you're going, but I'm standing with Christ and whatever he teaches because he's my Savior. You'd be surprised what that would do to some people just to have somebody say that. Now, looking on into verse 4, he gives us the reason that this must happen, that each member of the church in being faithful must strive to prepare themselves to recognize false teachers. Well, you have to recognize false teaching to recognize the teacher who teaches falsely. Again, that demands proper knowledge of the Bible. Uh, as we've said, if you in the case of a dollar bill, a genuine article, if you know what it is, then anything different from it is counterfeit. Well, there's all sorts of counterfeit religion saying that it's acceptable to God in Christ, but the Bible will tell you whether it's so or whether it's not. So here in writing part of the New Testament, part of the Bible, Jude, and of course God by the Holy Spirit is saying Jude is saying, you need to know there are certain men crept in unawares. Now, remember, John, we think, wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, even the Gospel of John, in the 90s, maybe, possibly a little earlier, but at least that time period. But now, Jude, we can't figure out for sure when he wrote, but it would have been sometime before that. So you can't just say, well, John wrote later than Jude, so Jude is coming after John in the canon, so he must be have written later. No, it doesn't work that way. Um, Jude could have very well been dead by this time. And this is a good time to say this. You surely remember that 
Second Peter and Jude are so closely associated. Um, I would suggest that you go over to Second Peter 2 and look at it. Uh, later on, I hope to be able to go from here, the book of Jude, when we finish it and just start back over First Peter, go through it, and then Second Peter. We'll have more time, Lord willing, to spend on this point. But this tells us something when you read so much in one book and then the same thing in another book. They were very closely associated with one another. Uh, possibly Jude even read what Peter wrote. But it seems only natural they would be. Peter was a Jew from Galilee. Jude and James, being half-brothers of Jesus, were raised in the same area. Remember that the half brothers of Jesus didn't believe he was the son of God until after his resurrection, but here they are very faithful as far as we know in the way that they're revealed in the book of James and in um, uh, by Jude here. They're both acknowledging clearly that Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Nazareth is their savior. He's their Lord, their master, their king. So they're not thinking of him at all as, as a fleshly kin. So he is saying the same thing that Peter's saying. There are certain men crept in. This crept is interesting. You don't think about people who are honest and bold. and um, They're not having anything to hide. It's creeping around. In fact, we sometimes have a slang word that we apply to some people colloquial expression, um, so-and-so's a creep. Well, that never has had a good connotation. And so it doesn't have here that these people have crept in. They haven't been open. They haven't been honest. You might say they slipped in by the side door. That tells you something of their character and how bad it was and that they were up to no good at all. So certain men... And they've come in, and you're unaware of them. Well, of course, somebody's becoming aware of them, or this letter couldn't have been written, and people couldn't take it for, for uh, take it for what it, it says and apply. He says the kind he further describes the kind of characters they have when he says who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Well, this doesn't mean, as the Calvinist teaches, that uh, they were born lost and predestined the poor ordained against their will to be wicked people. And even if they had wanted to be, God foreordained them to be, so they're just that way. That doesn't mean that. It means that such people as they've chosen to be, being that they chose to be wicked people and to be false teachers by their own choice, then they're ordained in the sense they're appointed. Um, People are ordained to hell. That doesn't mean God sends them there and they don't want to go. And they're doing all they can not to go and believing and obeying him. It means because they've chosen to reject in some way or the other the way of salvation and the gospel, which is God's power to save, Romans 1, 16, that they have assigned themselves that place. And so these, by their choice, by their own volition, they have chosen to come in, slip sliding away and in the side door, unawares, they have ulterior motives. As you go back and read First Timothy chapter 4, Paul describes these same type of characters to Timothy. Well, Timothy's a preacher. He needs to know these things. He's going to meet these fellows. He's going to have to, he remains faithful, deal with them. And so it is with every member of the church. Now, this brings this up. There was not only persecution coming from unbelieving Jews and even more so unbelieving Gentiles. And finally, even the Roman state begins to uh, persecute the church. So they also came from within the church. These are crept in unawares. They're slippery characters. And they're up to no good. And you as a member of the church needs to make a difference in these folks who are honest, sincere, dedicated, 
and obedient, faithful children and these who are not. Now, we've already run across that in uh, John's writing in First John. And then we saw in just the last epistle of John, John warning Gaius, who he addressed his letter to, he warned him of different ones who were wicked. It's obvious then that the early church, in standing true to the gospel, in each Christian being faithful, had to be forearmed. And they were forearmed of such things by being forewarned. And sometimes, very specifically, names were called. Uh, we noticed that in the third epistle of, of John when it came to doctrine figures. Well, these are members of the church, yet they're wicked, they're wrong. Now, it's interesting that you don't have to go too long into the book of Acts after the church was established in Acts 2, before we come across, in fact, it's the first sin in the church. And we find out an ice of power. Well, they're in the very, very presence of the apostles. Well, we don't know this, but they could have very well. It doesn't stretch anything to say they could have seen Jesus. They could have heard him. Um, they certainly were aware of the apostles and what they preached which meant they were aware of the miracles that the apostles did. And yet they still conspired as a husband and wife with one another to end up lying to God. Well, you saw how God thought about that. He killed them immediately. So there was plenty of material there for people to realize that you cannot trifle with godly things. Now, God doesn't strike people dead like that every time someone like that sins or engages in any kind of sin. And I'm thankful to God that such does not happen, that God is long-suffering. And yet it tells us that ultimately the final judgment that he will bring forth upon those who die lost, whether outside of Christ or as an unfaithful member of the church, you know how you're going to be dealt with before the judgment day ever gets here. Depart from me ye that work iniquity into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So I must, and you must, and God expects that as a part of our faithfulness to him in the church, we must ever examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith. Now that just means is what I'm believing now, what I'm thinking now, how I'm living now, my actions, are they authorized by Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior? And if they're not authorized in his last will and testament, then they're sinful. So according to Colossians 3.17 and like passages, whatsoever we do in word or in deed, we do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. That is by his authority. That's what it is to do something in the name of Christ. Giving thanks to God the Father by him. Now, that's what we must do. People need to train their minds so where any time something comes up, they hear it or they read it or whatever. They ask the question, did Jesus authorize that? Or maybe they ask, is that forbidden in the New Testament of Christ? That would satisfy so many problems if people would just learn how the New Testament authorizes and then every time something comes up they're not sure of, just ask the question, is that authorized by my Lord and Savior? I say he's my king, thus he has all authority, which he himself announced he did, as Matthew records in Matthew 28, verse 18. Well then, shouldn't I then do what Paul by inspiration said in Colossians 3, 17? Shouldn't I act with his authority? And if I don't have it, then I don't. Or if he's Forbidden it, I don't. So I need to ask myself that question. You shouldn't just wait and say, uh, let me ask somebody who knows more than I do. That doesn't mean we can't depend on people who may very well know more than we do. But we need to be striving and have as a routine part of our thinking the idea of, well, you said that, now let's see. Does Jesus in his last one in Testament authorize such a thing? And if we can't find a direct statement, 
if we can't find an example that is a pattern, and if we can't find that thing implied, we don't have authority to act, and so we don't do it. And somebody said, well, I'm unsure. Then don't do it till you are sure. That's the point. Because you can't do it in faith, because faith comes by hearing the word of God, if you're unsure. So we can't act without the authority of the Lord, but to act with the authority of the Lord is to act by faith. So if we can't act with the authority of the Lord, we can't act by faith. Therefore, when something comes up, and we may need to study it to find out whether it is authorized, well, then give yourself that time. And if you're unsure until you can study, well, then just don't do it because we're to act by faith. How are we going to walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, which if you're faithful to the Lord, you do. If you can't be sure that what you believe in practice is authorized by the Christ. Well, that same source of authority, the New Testament, will be the standard of authority on the day of judgment, John 12, verse 48. So for there are certain men who are kept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation by their own choice to live an ungodly life or a life of error. He calls them ungodly men. And here gives us a hint as to what they were doing turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what are some of the ways that you can turn the grace or the favor of God that saves us, the favor of God we don't deserve, can't merit? How can we turn that into something else? And he says here, lasciviousness. Well, you'll remember when Paul was writing to the church at Rome that he got to what we have as chapter 6 and verse 1. And he asked the brethren there a rhetorical question. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And then he says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So what is he saying? Simply because we're saved by the great favor of God, we don't deserve it. We can't work in any way to merit it. That doesn't mean we should just go on out here and not strive with all of our power and might to abide in the truth of God. You remember, John said, little children don't sin. That's the goal of every faithful child of God. From the time a person is obedient to the gospel, thus converted to Christ, all their life, they don't want to sin. They try to cultivate a mindset that hates sin and loves the truth, which we are exhorted to do, to love the truth. But you can't love sin and love the truth too. But you know that you're a human being and you need the grace of God. So when you're baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, what sin? The sins originally alienated you from him, made you a sinner, and the need of salvation Christ offers to the gospel. When you do that, you're then baptized into a state of grace, a place of favor. Well, evidently, some must have got the idea that means, well, since I'm, I'm, I'm a favorite, I'm a child of God, and I'm a favorite, I'm in a state of favor, I just go ahead and sin any way I want to. After all, I'm favored. Well, that's not at all what is meant by Paul in Romans 6. And so he dissolves that false view in his reader's mind when he says that's not the way at all. What being in the favor of God does is give the sincere, dedicated child of God the opportunity to strive with all their might to keep the commandments. And yet we know we're covered by the favor of God. It was never meant to be bestowed upon those who didn't care about living as God commands. But it's bestowed upon those who, in obedience to the gospel, raised to walk in newness of life, a new creature in Christ. They're the ones that enjoy the favor because they're striving with all their might to live according to the truth. And thus, the blood of Christ cleanses them 
they're in the favor of God. Well, this is partly what's involved here in Jude when he says they've turned the grace of our God to lasciviousness. Lasciviousness means just do about anything you want to to gratify the appetites of the flesh. And uh, God's grace, God's favor, you're one of his. You're going to be all right. Well, then what's all of this business throughout the rest of the New Testament about the works of the flesh in Galatians 5? And if you do those things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Obviously, that can't be the case. So it must be that there must have been somebody at least, or bodies in the church, these false teachers who crept in unawares, ungodly people who are trying to say you can live any way you want to live. If you're in Christ, you're in his favor. He's not going to send you to hell. But that's not what the rest of the Bible teaches. And the Bible does not contradict itself in any way whatsoever. So the statements about us, members of the church, God's children, being in God's favor as members of the church is applied to those who are steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It's not said of those who are overtaking their trespass and won't repent of it, who are worldly in their thoughts and actions and don't try to correct themselves. The favor of God is extended to those who love him and keep his commandments. And it takes care of the one who is striving with all their power to know the truth and live it and grow up in greater knowledge and practice of the truth and in the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So whatever they were doing, they were trying to say, you can do as you please here and the grace of God will cover you no matter how far off you are from the teachings of the Christ in your conduct. Notice they, he goes so far to say, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I don't know all that, that involved, but let's just say that it involved very early uh, doctrines that John dealt with, such as Gnosticism. Well, John said some of the same type of words when it came to the Gnostics. And so here, he's saying they, if you deny that Christ came in flesh, as John did, or he just appeared to come in flesh and all that kind of thing, then you're denying Christ. And that'd be true of anybody saying, well, I'm a Christian. But denying the things the Bible teaches Christians are to do to be faithful. But we'll have to stop here. And before we do, as our custom is, let's go to Heavenly Father and pray. Our holy and righteous Father, we're so thankful we've been able to be together. Think about thy good terms and that we have the words that help us understand abiding in the doctrine and being protected by thy sheltering wings in the shadow of thy hand. We're thankful, Father, for thy word that enlightens us. And we pray that we will prepare ourselves, first of all, to examine ourselves in the light of the truth, and then to examine all other things and other people and what they teach. Help us, Father, and guide us. May we put our trust in thee, and may we ever say, not our will, but thine be done. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.